All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 11, Section 5, Free Soil or Slave, The Dilemma of the West. So let us just recall very quickly that in the last section, we talked about the Mexican War, uh, the war between the United States, Mexican-American War, technically, uh, the war between the United States and Mexico from 1846 to 1848. And that led to new territory being added to the United States, which was called the Mexican Session. And in the Mexican Session was the important state of California. Now, most of this territory is pretty sparsely populated. That was until the gold rush. And the gold rush in 1848 sent, you know, really hundreds of thousands of people into California which ultimately meant that California was ready for statehood. And the reason why California is really kind of surprised, it's really sudden in a lot of ways. Sudden uh, statehood is a problem is because now California needs to enter as either a free state, that is a state in which slavery is illegal, or a slave state. And this ultimately becomes the debate here, right? Free soil or slave. So there were efforts by, um, by some individuals, specifically Northerners in Congress, to try and prevent the expansion of slavery into this Mexican session, that is the territory added from the Mexican-American War. One of them was the Wilmot Proviso. The Wilmot Proviso was an effort, an effort to ban slavery, sort of preemptively ban slavery in the Mexican session. Again, we're talking primarily about California, but also um, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, Nevada, uh, that sort of territory. Now, this is coming at a time in you know, the late 1840s where the Congress is split on this. Uh, demographic changes has meant that the population has grown way more significantly in the North than it has in the South. So for example, the Wilmot Proviso is approved by the House of Representatives, being that uh, at this point anyways, the number of people living in the North um, sort of counterbalanced the three-fifths compromise that gave Southerners more political power. And of course, as more time goes on, the population of the North grows larger and larger. This is due mostly to immigration, but other factors as well. But the Wilmot Proviso is struck down by the Senate. And so this effort by Northerners to ban slavery sort of preemptively ultimately fails. Interestingly enough, this debate has very little to do with the second party system. That is your Whigs and your Democrats. Um, and this was something that we saw earlier when it came to Missouri, that the split over California, so we might say split over California, has less to do with Whigs and Democrats, that is one political party supporting it and one political party against it, is North versus South. You know, depending on where one is located in the nation has much more to do with where one's stance is. And uh, these political parties begin to erode. In a lot of ways, we could say slavery uh, erodes, if that's how you spell erodes, um, the second party system. You know, because now you have, uh, and we'll see this in a second, uh, you'll have Northern and Southern Whigs arguing with each other and Northern and Southern Democrats arguing with each other. Uh, other parties begin to, you know, other parties are created to stake out a claim on this issue. The Liberty Party, we'll call this an anti-slavery party. Uh, pretty small, but at least uh, there is, uh, you know, some organization behind specific positions that are opposed to slavery. And uh, we should also keep in mind that there is sort of a, just a technical difference here, and that is between what is considered anti-slavery and abolitionism. Abolitionism or the abolitionist movement is more of a social slash political movement. Um, essentially, the, you know, the, the best way to sort of tell the two apart, I would say, is that the abolitionists really want no compromise. That is, slavery needs to end, and slavery needs to end now. 
whereas the anti-slavery position is against slavery, but there is a willingness to compromise, um, especially on the issue of where slavery currently exists. So for the most part, the anti-slavery position is to prevent the spread of slavery. You know, that's really kind of uh, where they take their position for the most part to prevent it from, from spreading. They don't really, uh, you know, they're not really committed to the idea of trying to end slavery in places like the Deep South where it currently exists, but they will do everything in their power to, to try and prevent it from, from spreading. And so we can see this in the election of 1848, which becomes, you know, or which is a, a presidential election year. Uh, the splitting of the second party system is seen within the Democratic Party. The barn burners are the anti-slavery part of the Democratic Party. The hunkers are the pro-slavery part of it. So here, one of these political parties is fracturing because of this particular issue. Um, other people take a different stance. Now, again, let's go back up to the top here. Seemingly, there are only two positions to take on this issue. Either you want the free state of California, or I should say, yeah, we'll say California, or the slave state of California. But there's actually a third position, and this is a position that really begins to gain momentum and gain favorability from both Southerners and Northerners in some respects. And that is the idea of popular sovereignty. And popular sovereignty, at least for the moment in the 18, early 1850s, seems like almost a miracle solution. Popular sovereignty says, let the people of the state vote on the legality of slavery. You know, this is something that is democratic, right? It's very much American in that sense. It makes it so that Congress doesn't have to deal with the issue. So representatives from South Carolina and Massachusetts don't have to constantly argue about this. They can you know, solve other problems in the nation. And both the North and the South are pretty confident that if left up to a vote, you know, the people will vote in their position. Now it's not supported by everyone, but it does gain a lot of momentum. Um, other parties that are created in the election of 1848 also include the Free Soil Party. This is, again, an anti-slavery party. And this mostly has to do with the fact that none of the existing political parties, the Democratic Party or the Whig Party, really have a comprehensive position on the issue of slavery in the Western territories. These are political parties that are trying to appease both Northern and Southern constituents. And this is coming at a time over, you know, as the years go on, where both Northerners and Southerners become more entrenched in either their anti-slavery or pro-slavery positions. In fact, many Northerners were convinced that there was a slave power that was in control of the federal government. We'll say slave power, the power of slave owners, slave owners in the government, uh, especially those in the South. You know, if you had just looked at something like the office of the presidency, more most presidents up until this point were from the South, and that was considered to be part of this slave power that Northerners feared. Uh, interestingly enough, for all the debate about slavery in California, um, the 1848 election really turned out not to have as much to do with it as Americans elected Zachary Taylor, the general and war hero of the Mexican-American War, who was, you know, he didn't really hold a very strong position on this particular issue. Uh, you know, he pretty much didn't care uh, whether or not, uh, you know, it, the Western territories went for slavery or against slavery. But nonetheless, this was still a crisis for Congress because California, in the meantime, had drafted up a constitution um, that would admit California as a free state. So California created a free constitution. And, um, you know, one of the things, constitution, that made California different than other examples like Missouri, like Texas, was that for all practical purposes, there were no slaves already in California by the time it, it uh, 
uh, admitted for um, uh, to become a state for statehood, whereas there were already slaves in Missouri, there were already slaves in Texas. Um, and so this question or the Compromise of 1850 would once and for all answer this question about slavery in the Mexican session. Henry Clay, our great compromiser, you know, this guy has been around forever in American history at this point. He's pretty old, uh, I, I must say. Uh, this was the guy, uh, compromiser. Oops. Um, this was the same guy who created a compromise with the tariff crisis that saw Andrew Jackson almost lead an army onto South Carolina. And uh, as you can see, by 1850, 30 years after the Missouri Compromise, the compromise is more complicated. There are more moving pieces to try and get both um, Northerners and Southerners to agree on it. So the Compromise of 1850 has five different parts to it. Uh, the first part is that California will enter as a free state. For the most part, this was a given. Um, it was very unlikely that Southerners would convince Congress to make California a slave state simply because the people of California had already taken the initiative and created a free constitution. Again, there were practically no slaves um, from a you know, practical standpoint in California. Other territories, Utah and New Mexico, which were still sparsely populated, but one day might enter the Union, it was decided that those would be up for popular sovereignty. So um, when the time came, the people would vote in those areas whether or not slavery would be legal or illegal. Northerners who were, you know, disgusted by the fact that the slave trade still took place in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., also demanded an end to the slave trade there. So in D.C., the slave trade, not slavery itself, but the slave trade was abolished in D.C. as part of this. Southerners, what they really get out of this, and maybe one of the more consequential aspects of the Compromise of 1850 is a new fugitive slave law. Again, fugitive slaves are runaway slaves. These are slaves that go from southern slave states, escape to the north. Now, if you go back to the Constitutional Convention, there was an agreement by northern states to return runaway slaves. At this point, those northern states are pretty reluctant to do that. They're, in some cases, just outright refusing. So Southerners demand that the federal government do something about it. This new fugitive slave law, we're just going to say, is more strict. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the, the consequences of this law. And lastly, just a sort of a very minor sort of um, part of the Compromise of 1850 was the uh, setting of the border between Texas and New Mexico. In terms of the two most important parts here, again, Northerners get a free California, Southerners get a new and stricter fugitive slave law.